Who do you think you are? Who do you think you are? This is a question that probably you've been asked at some point in your life. Now, it could have been that your parents asked you that question as they scolded you for some misdeed, some mistake that you made years and years ago. Maybe the person who asked that question was a supervisor who felt that you had overstepped your bounds, that you had gotten into some of their rights and responsibilities. Who do you think you are doing my job? Might have been someone who jealously threw out that question because they're questioning why you would be talking about an achievement in your life, some goal that you have attained, a special occurrence. And they're envious of it, really. Who do you think you are? Who do you think you are? You might find it hard at times to say who you are. In case it does come up, you might occasionally find that not only you have difficulty remembering who you are, but just remembering things at all. This older couple had figured out that they were struggling with sometimes remembering things. So they decided that when, our, when my spouse asked me to do something, I'm going to write that down. So one evening, she asked, she asked her husband, said, I'm going to the kitchen. You want anything? He said, yes. I want a big ice cream sundae, chocolate ice cream, whipped cream, and a red fresh cherry on top. She heads off to the kitchen. She said, hey, aren't you going to write that down? And she said, no, I got it. I'll remember. So she's gone a while. She comes back. And she sets out in front of him this big plate of hash browns, bacon, eggs, and grits. He looked at it and said, I knew you should have written it down. You forgot the toast. <laughs> you see, we can forget things. It, it can happen to any of us. Now, some people have a more severe type of forgetting. It's called amnesia. Amnesia. Well, today I'm wearing what I call my amnesia shirt. So if I ever get amnesia, I can just look down and hopefully it will remind me of who I am. You see, we want to know who we are. Now, our name, certainly that is a part of our identity. Who you are, that's your identity. And our name is at least a part of our identity. My full identity, it's a combination of many factors. I'm a son of Webster and Evelyn Richmond. I'm a husband, a father, a grandfather, a brother. I'm a pastor, a military man, a business owner, a confidant, a friend. If we went around the room and asked each of you to share, we would hear some similar comments from you. We'd hear some that were different from you. We would hear words like, I'm an employee, or I'm self-employed, I'm a student, or I'm a teacher, I'm a homemaker, or I'm the breadwinner, I'm married, I'm single, I'm divorced, I'm happily divorced. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> you're... Your social security number, your height, your weight, the color of your hair, the color of your eyes, all of these are parts of your identity. Now, why is it important for, for you and I to know who we are? Do we really need to be that aware of our identity? And the answer is yes. Let's look at a passage where we're going to see how Jesus' identity helped him get through a real challenging time. We're we'll looking at Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. Matthew chapter 4. We have this on your bulletins as well as we have this on the screen behind me. Verse 1. Then Jesus returned from the Jordan, full of the Holy Spirit, and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness for 40 days to be tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days, and when they were over, he was hungry. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, tell this stone to become bread. But Jesus answered him, It is written, Man must not live by bread alone. So he took him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. 
Then the devil said to him, I will give you their splendor and all this authority because it has been given over to me and I can give it to anyone I want. If you then will worship me, all will be yours. And Jesus answered him, It is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. So he took him to Jerusalem, had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, He will give his angels orders concerning you to protect you. And they will support you with their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered him, It is said, Do not test the Lord your God. After the devil had finished every temptation, he departed him from him for a time. Father, temptations come. Trials await us inside a church. And once we step outside the door, they're there as well. But Father, we know that there's an identity that you've called us to. And when we claim that identity, when we fulfill that identity, then we can survive our times in the wilderness. Father, we just pray you teach us now, how do we claim that? How do we know who we are in you? We love you in the holy name of Jesus. Amen. All of us, whether now or sometime in the future, are going to face wilderness times. We've told you we have some friends who work for Mission Aviation Fellowship, and hearing them talk about going to foreign countries, going to Lesotho, going to uh, Kenya, going into Central or South America, and the conditions. They, they move into a home, and it said that they'll, they'll wake up, and there's spiders this big, or there's tarantulas about this big, and there's snakes, and there are all kinds of special critters that, that you know Michael and David might enjoy having around to play with, but... But most families say no. Adopting a new culture as your own, trying to learn that, you know, that, that's a, a time of wilderness because it's so foreign and it's hard. It's a real challenge when you've left everything that you know, all the ways of life, all your family, all your friends, and it's hard. It's a wilderness time. You know God has called you to do that, but it doesn't make it any easier when you deal with all these other issues. We all will face wilderness times. There are moments and there are months when you are tried, you are tested, you are tempted. And your identity, who you think you are, will, 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 it will determine how you're going to respond during your wilderness time. Eugene Judon, 25, of Miami, Florida, has an unusual distinction. He's high on the government's list of not wanted men. Not wanted men. A judge asked that in every post office in federal buildings around the country, they post a picture of Eugene U Judon and this caption under it says, Do not arrest this man. Do not arrest this man. Now, why would this judge, Alfonso Sepe of Dade County, Florida, why would he have that? Well, because Eugene Judon has, if you will, a twin. A Eugene Judon, age 25, born the same day, but he is from Chicago versus the person who's from Miami. And the one from Miami has been arrested a number of times because he got the same name and birth date of this Eugene Judon, the criminal from Chicago. And the judge says, leave him alone. Tell the police to leave the guy alone. It all began on a Christmas Eve when Eugene Judon from Chicago escaped from the Dade County Correctional Facility. And he's been on the loose ever since. Police shouldn't have too much trouble if they run across Eugene Judon because they're both about the same weight, but the one from Miami is about 5'3", and the other's about 5'8". Should be pretty easy to tell the two guys apart. You see, sometimes you don't have to do anything to wind up in a wilderness situation. You're being hunted, you're being arrested, you're being tested, and you did nothing to bring it on. 
Satan works in a lot of ways. The, the point is, you're going to encounter a wilderness time. You're going to have the difficulties, you're going to have the challenges like you never dreamed would come upon you. It just happens. So how did Jesus make it through? Let's look at how the identity of Jesus was determined. Because it was his identity that gave him victory over Satan and the temptations during his time in the wilderness. How was Jesus' identity determined? Well, you have to ask a question. Where was Jesus' identity? Where did it come from? And second, when was it established? Let's look at Luke chapter 1. Verse 26. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth. To a virgin engaged to a man named Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came to her and said, Rejoice, favored woman. The Lord is with you. Now the angel comes, kind of frightens her. Says, hey, relax lady, the Lord is with you. But she's still a little uncertain about this. But she was deeply troubled by this statement. Wondering what kind of greeting this could be. Then the angel told her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. Now listen. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will call his name Jesus. He will be great, and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, for his kingdom will have no end. Mary asked the angel, How can this be, since I have not been intimate with a man? The angel replied to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Think about Mary's life. Her, her position in life at this time. Mary, uh, she's a young lady. It's, uh, it's expected that she was a teenager. And she just sees herself like she's just any other teenager. And, and she's about to get married. This is a great time in her life. She, she's got Joseph and they're going to get married. And they're already planning their future. They can see all their life together. And suddenly an angel shows up. And says, you're, you're about to have a baby. And you're going to call him Jesus. She's going, whoa, wait a minute. I've not been intimate with a man. How am I going to be pregnant? He says, the Holy Spirit's going to take care of this. Do you think that Mary at all expected something like this in her life? Think that her mother, when she was just an infant, said, you know, God's going to use you in a great way, little girl. Probably didn't happen. And what kind of situation does that put Mary in? When she's going to be pregnant, but not married. Think about the wilderness that creates for her. There's a, a mental wilderness there of, why me? Why would I be chosen for this honor, this responsibility? But after Gabriel fully explained this, Mary's resistance waned and she accepted her new role. Verse 38. I am the Lord's slave, said Mary. May it be done according, may it be done to me according to your word. I am the Lord's slave. May it be done to me according to your word. Is that hard to do? Knowing the wilderness at the head of you, but say, I am the Lord's slave. In our entertainment-oriented culture, and tonight you guys get to experience some of that, we have a number of people around the world in Christian music. When God looks at their heart, he probably sees they want to be on stage because I'm seen. They're, they're singing, and boy, look at me. Not all, certainly. Oh, by the way, I forgot to make an announcement earlier. I want to go back to that. Just happened to see something yesterday. For those of you who know the name Creeflo Dollar, Creeflo Dollar, he has uh, asked his congregation and his supporters, he would like for them, 200,000 of them, to donate $300 each to buy him a new $65 million luxury jet so he can fly around the globe doing ministry. 
$65 million. Well, I'm going to do something a little different. Along that same line, though, I'm going to ask each of you guys to roll up about $23.16 and see if I can't buy a $600 rusted out pickup truck to go around to a ministry in. <laughs> now, you know, I, I can't imagine standing in front of the congregation, standing in front of uh, your supporters and saying, I need a $65 million brand new Gulfstream jet. Is that about God? What can you do with $65 million for the kingdom? You can build a bunch of churches for $65 million. The, the, the Gideons come each year. How many Bibles can we buy to give away around the world with $65 million? But see, sometimes people in ministry, it can become about them rather than about God. I don't know Creepo Dollar, never met him, but I cannot see how anyone could ask for $65 million for a plane to ride around in. I, I don't see. I'm being judgmental here. Forgive me for that, God. I cannot see how that is about God. But in our entertainment culture, for some people, they think that performing on stage at a winter jam would be just the, the pinnacle of life. A gentleman named Dallas Holm has been involved in Christian ministry music for decades. He said, I frequently have young people come up and say, you know, I'm just never going to be happy unless I get to do what you do. He tells them, said, then you will never be happy in life. Because your happiness doesn't come from what you do for him. Your happiness comes from who you are in him. What is your identity in Christ? That's where your happiness comes from. Not what you're doing for him. Although we can, be, we can rejoice, we can celebrate, we can delight in doing what we do for him. But that's not where my happiness comes from. See, Mary was willing to become the Lord's slave. Not just, okay, I can do this. She says, I'm willing to become your slave. That's a very different level. Her happiness... Her actions, her identity, they're not going to be tied in what she does. She proclaimed her identity when she said, I will be your slave. Well, sometimes we don't want to be a slave. Sometimes we're looking for herself. His profile is on the top recruiting websites. They, they tout him as a pro-style quarterback. His blog breathlessly recounts his accomplishments, rave reviews of those who've seen him play. All-American, MVP, a future Tom Brady in action. Darren is the man for real, F-A, real. Accurate, good technique, can take a hit. Darren's my fave QB in the nation. But you see, Darren is 12 years old. He's five foot two, 105 pounds. He's a wisp of a kid. And there, his parents have got this website for him. And they're touting him as the next Tom Brady. Now, parents, yeah, we like to be involved. His parents and coaches and those who run the many football camps that he attend each year. They're attempting to establish his identity. Parents, we like to do that with our children. We want to help establish their identity. But they're saying, who are you, Darren Bryden? You are a future Hall of Fame quarterback. And he's 12 years old. They're trying to establish an identity. But consider this, my dear friends. When you become a slave, you give up. You sacrifice. You relinquish control of so many things. Mary didn't even get to choose the name of her son. Think about that. You're going to carry this child for nine months. You endure the ridicule of all the populace. And you don't even get to choose the name of your child? What a sacrifice. Does she get to establish his identity? Not just in name. She didn't get to guide him toward a career path. Because the scriptures already said what he's going to be doing. The Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. 
Do you think the Son of God's going to be working down here at the local bakery? Do you think he's going to be over here in the carpentry shop, you know, when he's 65 years old? Just carving crosses into the cabinets that he makes? No. She didn't get to involve herself in his future path. His identity, because his identity had already been determined by God. And Jesus knew his identity had been determined. For those of us who grew up in a world of comic books and superheroes, one of the requirements for superheroes was they had to have a secret identity. Come on up here, David. Had to have a secret identity. See, now we have Superman. Well, Superman had a secret identity, right? Clark Kent. And then there's Batman. Come up here, Batman. We got Batman. And Batman had a secret identity, right? Bruce Wayne. And then we had Wonder Woman. Come up here, Emily. Come up here. Come on. And we had Wonder Woman. And Wonder Woman had a secret identity. Diana Prince. And, of course, then there's Captain America, you know, who was secret identity of Steve Rogers. So they all had secret identities. Thank you, guys. appreciate that. <laughs> they all had secret identities. Why did they have a secret identity? Because the standard line among superheroes is that if people know who you are, then all your family, all your loved ones... They will, be, they will become the targets of these nefarious criminals and villains. So they had to have a secret identity. But you see, Jesus didn't have a secret identity. Jesus didn't go around with a, a mask and a cape on. You know, as he's going out and, and feeding thousands and healing the sick and rescuing damsels in distress who've fallen down in front of this runaway Roman chariot. Uh, there was no secret identity there. When he's healing, when he's creating miracles, or when he's teaching, when he's working there with his parents, what you saw is what you got every time. Jesus' identity was known to him. Luke chapter 2, verses 41 to 52. Every year his parents traveled to Jerusalem for the Passover festival. When he was 12 years old, same age as our little football player we saw a bit ago, when he was 12 years old, they went up according to the custom of the festival. After those days were over, as they were returning, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, but his parents did not know it. Assuming he was in the traveling party, they went a day's journey. Then they began looking for him among their relatives and friends. When they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem to search for him. After three days, they found him in the temple complex, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. And all those who heard him were astounded at his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. Why were you searching for me? He asked them, didn't you know that I had to be in my father's house? Didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? Jesus knew his identity. At age 12, he, he had it. He, he got it. I am the son of God. His parents, you know, they, they come for the, the Passover, for the festival, and then they leave. And there's this long group of people. It's not just you picking up your kids and, and going out like we do today. There's this huge throng of people that are going back. So they assume that Jesus is back there with the other 12-year-olds. And after a day, they finally get to looking for him. And he's not there. It kind of remind you of that movie Home Alone. You know, they head off to Paris. And Kevin is left home alone. You know, Kevin didn't go roaming the neighborhood. He stayed at his father's house. Jesus went to his father's house. He knew his identity. And he knew where he needed to be during this time. <clears throat> How important is it when you, you know your identity? 
when he knows his identity, he says, I know who I am. John Howard Griffin was a white man who believed he could never understand the plight of African Americans unless he became like one. In 1959, he darkened his skin with medication, sun lamps, and stains. He traveled all around the South. His book titled Black Like Me helped whites better understand the humiliation and discrimination faced then daily by people of color. See, he couldn't identify with these people because he wasn't like them. So only by becoming more like black people and walking in their life, living in their life daily, could he fully understand them. Well, part of the identity of Christ was that he was like us. The incarnation of, of God is evidence that God understands our plight. Isaiah 53, 3. He was despised and rejected by men. A man of suffering who knew what sickness was. He was like someone people turned away from. He was despised and we didn't value him. Sound like Jesus' life? Jesus knew who he was. And when the announcement was made, the world also knew. If an individual or, or an organization today wants to make an announcement, they've got so many technological means to spread that message all around the globe in just a matter of a fraction of seconds. And sometimes those messages hit their intended target, and sometimes they are wide right or they're wide left. They just miss it. An announcement in a Russian newspaper. There will be a Moscow exhibition of arts by 15,000 Soviet Republic painters and sculptors. These were executed over the past two years. <laughs> Sometimes the message doesn't quite communicate what we would like it to. Other announcements are delivered with a dose of intended wry humor. Large co corporation recently announced that they had hired a stray dog as their corporate vice president. The announcement in the company bulletin read, his, his ability to get along with anyone, his prompt response to a pat on the back, his interest in watching others work, and his great knack for looking wise while saying nothing make him a perfect fit for this position. <laughs> but we see in the third chapter of Luke, two announcements, two proclamations that are made, very dramatic, very impactful announcements. Announcements that achieve their goal of letting the world know that Jesus is the Son of God. Verse 15. Now the people were waiting expectantly, and all of them were debating in their minds whether John might be the Messiah. John answered them all, I baptize you with water, but one is coming who is more powerful than I. I am not worthy to untie the strap of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing shovel is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn. But the chaff he will burn up with a fire that never goes out. Then, along with many other exhortations, he proclaimed good news to the people. But Herod the Tetrarch, being rebuked by him about Herodias, his brother's wife, about all the evil things Herod had done, added this to everything else. He locked John up in prison. Verse 21. When all the people were baptized, Jesus also was baptized. As he was praying, heaven opened, and the Holy Spirit descended on him in a physical appearance like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son. I take delight in you. You are my beloved Son. The announcement goes to the whole world. They hear this. They've never seen anything like this. Baptisms, yes, but nothing, nothing like this. Jesus knew who he was, and now the world knew who he, he was. There's no secret identity here. But now the question is exactly where we started. Who do you think you are? We know who Jesus is. He certainly knew who he was. Determining our identity can be challenging. Sometimes we identify with another person. 
When Abraham Lincoln was shot, his body was taken by train to Springfield, Illinois. And they stopped at many major cities, offering citizens opportunity to, to view the casket. Usually there was a procession from the railroad station to City Hall where the body would lie in state. As the hearse was moving through the streets of New York City, a large husky woodsman pressed forward. I mean, he just really fighting his way through the crowd. Let me through, let me through. And one guy said, hey man, stop it. You're stepping on my feet. And this, this lumberjack is apologizing. He said, I've just got to get up there to the casket. This man said, why must you? He said, two of my brothers died in the same cause that he did. Besides, he proudly added, he was one of my craft. And I can never go back to the woods without seeing and blessing his coffin. He identified with Abraham Lincoln, the wood splitter that we've heard about for so many years. We might identify with someone like an Abraham Lincoln, but we also might lose our identity in doing that. Pastor Eloy Gonzalez talks about the first time that he was asked to preach. He was serving, leading the youth in this church, and one day the pastor asked him, hey, won't you preach next week? And he said, I, I was flattered, but I didn't have the first clue about how to prepare a sermon. He said, so I came up with my own illustration. So it was kind of corny, but maybe it worked. He said, there were these Little, little wooden sticks and they lived in a paint bucket of red paint and all day long they just swam around in the red paint enjoying life swimming around in the red paint and then one day they, they had an invitation from the bucket next door some wood sticks there they said, hey why don't you come over and, and play over here well they're pretty excited about going somewhere else so they jump over to the bucket next door but it's blue paint and now they're in blue paint all the way up and down their, their wooden stick bodies and they lost their identity as red sticks. What do we immerse ourselves in? Do we allow ourselves to, to fall into something that will steal our identity in Christ? Do we know what our identity is in Christ? Who do you think you are? Who do you think you are in Christ? Maybe you've had amnesia and you've forgotten who you are in Christ. But I'm going to tell you who you are. Ephesians 2.10 from the Amplified Bible reads, For we are God's own handiwork, His workmanship, or created in Christ Jesus. Born anew that we may do those good works which God predestined for us. Taking paths which He prepared ahead of time that we should walk in them. Living the good life which he prearranged and made ready for us to live. The New Living Translation reads, For we are God's masterpiece. Kind of let that word just resonate. Think about that. Masterpiece. We are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. Who do you think you are? The dictionary defines a masterpiece as a person's greatest work of art or a consummate example of skill or excellence. Now, when God's Word describes you as a masterpiece, do you say yes? Or do you say to yourself, no, if He really knew me, I would not be called a masterpiece? What is your identity in Christ? Do you accept his assessment? Because if you accepted his love, you've accepted his salvation, then you are his masterpiece. But we keep looking at ourselves in the mirror and we think, well, I need to touch up here and maybe a little lift here and lose a little there and then I'll be, then I'll be good enough. Then I'll be perfect. No. We are his masterpiece today. Romans 8 verses 1 and 2 There's therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. We will not suffer the eternity in hell. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. What freedom! 
Your identity is, I am free. I can be a slave to Christ and yet be free in life. Because I am his child. I know that. Who do you think you are? When you know who you are, as Jesus knew who he was, you're going to have the strength then. You're going to survive. You're going to be able to get through your wilderness times because you are a child of Christ.